Hey, welcome to the DDPS, DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, uh, let's go over some rules and logistics. Uh, first, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you do have questions, you are welcome to unmute and um, ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences, uh, so no classified discussion is allowed. And finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now, let me introduce our uh, speaker today. It is an honor to host uh, Soldat Villar, who is an assistant professor of applied mathematics and statistics at Johns Hopkins University. She did her undergraduate studies at uh, Univer University, uh, Uni University de Republica Uruguay and her PhD in mathematics at UT Austin. Afterwards, she held postdoctoral position at UC Berkeley and New York University. In 2019, she was selected as a rising star in computational and data science. Her research is funded by NSF, ONL, Amazon and the uh, Simmons Foundation. <clears throat> Today, uh, so that we'll talk about uh, the passive symmetries of machine learning, which is a, uh, which will be very interesting. Um, uh, so please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk. Uh, now, without further ado, let me pass the button to uh, Soldat uh, by asking one random question as usual. Today's random question is, uh, what is your superpower um, that the people um, don't usually have? Uh, can you pick one mm. here with us? Um, well, okay. Uh, so, um, so I'm, I, I think that's something that unusual, I don't know if it's a superpower, but something unusual for me is that I'm from a small country in South America which is Uruguay mm -hmm. and uh, that's um, it it's interesting because I think that you get a different life experience than other people just because you come from like a very unusual place so people get very surprised about it great <laughs> thank you so that <laughs> you answered that well <laughs> okay the stage is yours <laughs> so uh, okay so I'm going to talk about the passive symmetries of machine learning. And uh, what I heard uh, about the audience is that you're mostly physicists uh, working on machine learning uh, related uh, stuff with, with physics. So I don't really need to give you the first slide about deep learning and how it has done uh, amazing things, changed the state of the art in several domains. This is just like an introductory slide where I say, well, people do amazing things with deep learning, image classification, uh, playing Go with reinforcement learning. And uh, lately, uh, the, there has been this development in um, protein folding. And my claim is that in all these uh, models, a, a key insight is the use of symmetries. and and also the, the use of overparametrization. So first I'm going to discuss a little bit about overparametrization, and then the main part of my talk is going to be about symmetries. And you know, in, in deep learning, we have these models that we use to fit the data, and they are very overparametrized. So we have maybe more parameters than data points, significantly more parameters than data points. So we have a training set, which are like say images and their labels. And then we have a hypothesis class, which is what functions we use to fit the data. So for instance, a convolutional neural network with 42 layers or something like that. So we train the model and we obtain uh, one classifier for my image classification network, which is like one choice on the space of parameters, uh, one choice on the space of weights. So, uh, there are many functions in this uh, hypothesis class of possible 42 layer neural networks that can fit the data and even they can fit the data perfectly. So how do you choose the right one? Uh, how do you make sure that your optimization model or like your optimization algorithm finds a function that satisfies 
that that not only fits the data but also it generalizes as well. And so there's a notion that people describe in the machine learning community, which is called the inductive bias, which is like like what is the right assumptions on your model and your optimization algorithm so that the algorithms that you use, they're typically based on local optimization, converge to a good solution. Namely, that not only fits the data well, but also it generalizes to data that it hasn't seen before. For instance, a test set that may have the same distribution as the training set or different one. And so, and, and there's uh, a lot of interesting work that had happened in the, in the past years regarding overparameterization and how what happens with using models that are very overparameterized. And so I have a few like plots or like drawings from papers in the literature. So one that I like very much, and you probably know about it, is called Understanding Deep Learning Requires Restraint and Generalization. And this model, in this paper, what shows is that uh, these overparameterized machine learning models can fit data any data that you want. They can fit until zero training error, and they can fit things like, like noise. They can fit uh, shuffle images with shuffled pixels. They can fit images with the wrong labels. And the fact that they can fit anything uh, tells you that, well, the fact that they can do it, why do they generalize well? And there is a, the, there are some explanations that have to do with like, how fast they can they can be trained and how well they generalize after that. There's uh, there's other works. Um, one is the double descent work, and there's also the benign overfitting work that people by people there at Berkeley that uh, that basically they show that uh, in over in overparameterized models you may get some something that that can be explained as they have better generalization. The idea is that in the classical statistical regime, uh, you can fit your, uh, you, you, you have a regime where like you do underfitting, a regime where you do overfitting, and then when the capacity of the model is like uh, um, the sweet spot, then you get the bias versus optimal bias versus variance trade-off, and that's the best model that you can get, like the, the lowest risk that you can get for this model. And what they show is that if you do overparameterized models in some settings, you can go below beyond this this low bar uh, and then get some uh, performance that is better than the classical optimal with very overparameterized models. That's what it means, and that's what they call the double descent and the benign overfitting phenomena. But all all that to say that over parameterized models have very weird um, performance and they have very interesting mathematical properties and just the design of the class of functions and the optimization algorithms that you're using is key for uh, having a model that performs well not only on the training data but also in the uh, general test data or general problem in general. And so uh, there's the notion of like the, what is the correct or a good inductive bias. So how do you design models so that they actually perform well? And so there's this recent book uh, by uh, Bronstein, Bruna and collaborators that is called Geometric Deep Learning. And basically they claim that you can exploit the structure of the input data and of the input problem uh, or, or and the problem so that in the design of the models so that they perform well like that would give you a good inductive bias and for example so for instance convolution neural networks are designed to work well with images and they have a symmetry property which is that they are translation equivalent uh, like if you've ever seen a cat and you translate this cat to the side then the the fact that the cnn is translation equivalent is a is a property that is useful for image classification. It kind of encodes the symmetries of the, of the actual problem. And then for instance, recurrent neural networks exploit some sort of translation symmetries. And then graph neural networks exploit a symmetry that has to do with symmetries that uh, are, um, like it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you express a graph. Uh, 
uh, as an adjacency matrix. And that's a passive symmetry, and I'm going to explain in the next, uh, in the next slide what are the passive symmetries. So, uh, in the physical sciences, uh, you may or may not agree with me, and this is something that we can discuss, is that there exist two types of symmetries. The active symmetries, which are the symmetries that come from the observed regularities of the physics, so, for instance, symmetries that have to do with conservation laws according to Noether's theorem. So, for instance, the fact that if we have conservation of energy, that is equivalent to say that there's a time translation symmetry in my dynamical system, or a conservation of momentum, which is uh, equivalent to a, a translation symmetry, and a conservation of angular momentum, which can be equivalent to a rotation symmetry. So, those are the active symmetries, symmetries that are observed regularities of the physics, and they have to do with modifications that we can do to the world and observe that something is preserved after we do this modification. And there's also the passive symmetries that are symmetries that are not symmetries of the world, but are symmetries that come from the fact that when I express this physical object in mathematical terms, the choice of expressing this object in math is not unique. I have to make a choice. And then if I do a transformation in my choice, then the, the world doesn't change. So this transformation should be translated into the physics, into the observ like into observations as well. So for instance, if I express this object uh, with some set of coordinates, and then I later come back and I uh, express the same object with a different coordinate coordinate system, then the then the observables should be consistent with the change of coordinates that I express. And this includes like units equivalence as well, uh, gauge invariances and equivalences, etc. So these are symmetries that are just like they come from the fact that there's not a unique representation. So the choice of the representation induces some symmetries that will show up. And for instance, say I have a physical system and I make some predictions based on everything expressed in, in every mass expressed in, in kilograms. If I change it to pounds, then the, the data will change and the predictions would change in a predictable way. That's what it means. Uh, like that's an example of a classic uh, passive symmetry. And so the claim is that the machine learning and data science methods should be consistent with these symmetries in order to be correct. Uh, so you you want to parameterize the space of functions so that they satisfy the symmetries of the problem, the active symmetries and the passive symmetries. And so an example that is very is is very common in machine learning right now, and people and this is a very active area of research, is the graph neural networks or graph learning. And the passive symmetry is a very simple symmetry. The idea is that whatever learning function that I express on a graph, so I have my graph, uh, and then I express this graph as an adjacency matrix, and so this is one possible adjacency matrix, the representation of the graph as an adjacency matrix is not unique. So I could choose a different ordering of the, of the nodes in my adjacency matrix, and it represents exactly the same graph. So if I take this, this graph represented in this way, and I do a permutations of these rows and these columns, then I obtain this graph, uh, this, this representation, and it's just a different way to represent the same object. So uh, the function that I learned should be consistent with respect to that change. So if it's like, say, if I'm just learning a number, say the length of the shortest path, then that number should be invariant with respect to this permutation. So what I'm saying is that uh, f of pi a pi transpose should be equal to f of a as an invariant function for all pi permutations. So this is the action of the permutation on the input space, and then the function needs to be invariant with respect to that action. Or if I'm learning like a node embedding, uh, so I'm learning some property for each node, then that node embedding should be equivalent with respect to this permutation action, meaning that if I permute the rows and the columns of my matrix, then the embedding needs to be permuted as well. And this is an equivalent. So the same group acts on the input and in the output. They don't necessarily act on the same way, but it's just like uh, it acts. Uh, it's, yeah. As, 
So the question is, how can we efficiently parameterize the space of invariant and equivariant functions with respect to permutations? And this is what people do in, in graph neural networks or graph learning. And so there are many interesting research questions in graph learning that have to do with like how to parameterize the functions that on graphs that are equivalent. So the typical way of doing this is by implementing it in a form of message passing. So because if you if you write like if message passing is just like you learn a function which is a message function that each node send to their neighbors, and then there's another function which is the aggregation function that each node like aggregates the message from their neighbors. And that is a very simple way to express something that does not depend on the representation of the graph as a matrix. So it's, it's equivalent just by definition. It's just like you need to know who your neighbors are and that's it. So this, this is like the classical way of doing graph neural networks. And, and the, but then there is like a very interesting area of research that says like, actually, if you just implement this, this message passing networks, uh, there are many functions that cannot be expressed by them, even though they're equivalent with respect to permutations or invariant. And the reason is because um, like this, this action by the permutations is connected with the graph isomorphism problem. And the graph isomorphism problem is not an easy problem. So uh, you may like just, just the complexity of this class of functions is not sufficient to separate non-isomorphic graphs, so certain non-isomorphic graphs. So there's like a, a lot of work uh, trying to understand what functions one can express with these models or how can, you can modify these models so that they can express more functions. And then some functions like, for instance, classical message passing neural networks are not able to compute trivial, trivial functions like the number of triangles in a graph. And so like you have to think a little bit, a little bit more and there's like many interesting works in this space. Um, yeah. And, and so, and other questions that people have studied are the stability of the graph neural networks. How do you, how can you evaluate the transferability? So say, what happens if I train a graph neural network on uh, graphs that have a hundred nodes and then evaluate them in graphs that have a thousand nodes? Can, how can we say that what this graph neural network is doing is consistent? And then there's a lot of work on like the evaluation of the performance of graph neural networks in benchmarks which are being developed and also in, in uh, theoretical models like random graph models. But that's, uh, that, so that's kind of like a connection between like some passive symmetry and, or some symmetry and then a model that relies on this symmetry which is graph neural networks and a lot of mathematical, interesting mathematical problems come from the actual symmetry of these models. And there's, that's just graph neural networks. And this is a, a big part of my research, but I'm not gonna focus on it on, on this talk. I, we, we can talk about it offline if you want, uh, or, or maybe if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them that now. But I'm just gonna, so th the idea for my talk today was to describe other symmetries that have to do with scientific machine learning. Any questions? No. Okay. So, so equivalent machine learning has to do with uh, the understanding of the symmetries that go into the machine learning models, and the applications include uh, like dynamical systems, fluid dynamics, graphs. I just mentioned it. Particle systems, in particular, for instance, the, pro the protein folding alpha fold uses equivalent transformers in part of the architecture. So it, it really shows up in, in many uh, scientific applications. And just it's not just graphs, it goes beyond that. So I'm going to explain other ways that um, symmetries go into the definition of the machine learning models and how to implement them and, and how to evaluate them. So the, um, So if I have time, I'm going to describe how, how to implement different equivariant models on particle systems, how to implement equivariant models on images. And, and I have a few applications. One is a toy example that is easy to see what's going on. And then we have applications to cosmology 
and to vegetation dynamics that I can describe uh, us. Yeah. So, uh, can I ask a question? Yes. So earlier you had mentioned that there's this difference between these active and passive symmetries. Um, an, inter an example for a physical system would be where if I'm thinking about an active symmetry, uh, how can I get conservation of energy by implementing the right set of symmetries in my modeling or, or wherever so that energy is conserved? Is that also part of the consideration here? Yes. So I'm going to, I have an example at the, at the end of my talk where we do that. But the idea is that if you, if you know that your system is Hamiltonian, uh, then you can, uh, you can use something like a neural ODE that does uh, Hamiltonian integration. So then they ha like the fact that there's a, there's a constant Hamiltonian is already embedded in the model. So the uh, energy conservation is part of the definition of your, of your model. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll look forward to that example later. Yeah. So, okay, so how do you implement symmetries? Okay, the classical thing that people do is do data augmentation, uh, but I'm going to focus on like architectural design, which is like I'm going to restrict the learning to the class of functions that satisfy the symmetries. And the way people do it is by using weight sharing, like for instance, message passing is a form of weight sharing because it's the same message that goes to, to every node the message function, not the same message, but the same function. Then there is a, an approach based on introducer representations that I'm going to describe very briefly. Uh, and then I'm going to go into the idea of using invariant theory for that. So, um, so the idea is, so we have a group action and maybe I, I should have like a little drawing like here. So say, uh, maybe I had it before or not. Yeah, here. Uh, I think I skipped this slide. So uh, the idea is that you have a group that acts on a data set. And then if you, if you apply the group action to the input and then the output doesn't change, then you say that it's invariant. So for instance, in this image classification, if you rotate the image, then the classifier doesn't change or equivariant. So for instance, here I have this particle system and I have, I want to predict the dynamics. So if I rotate this particle system, then the prediction should rotate. And the idea of equivalent ML is that uh, the hypothesis class satisfy that for every choice of parameters, so for every theta, for every function you, in your hypothesis class, it satisfies the symmetry. So for every theta, f of g times x is equal to uh, g times f of x, for instance, here. So that's the idea. So the question is, how do you implement a class of functions that satisfy this property? So one way of doing that is by uh, saying, okay, I'm gonna start with a feed forward neural network, which is the composition of linear functions and nonlinear activation functions. And then I'm going to restrict the linear functions so, so that they satisfy the symmetries. And so there, since there are not that many linear functions that are symmetric, like say, if you say like a rotation invariant functions, how many linear functions are rotation invariant? Not very many. Uh, so, so then what you do in order to make the, the space of functions expressive is you extend these two tensors. So you say, okay, the linear functions are not just going to take a vector, but they are going to take a tensor of the input with itself k times, and they're going to output a tensor with the, of, of the input with itself k prime times. And so you want to look at the functions that are linear and that are equivalent here by just extending the action to each of the orders of the tensor. And the question is, how do you do that? And uh, one person that, it, that did a lot of this work is Tess Smith, which I think was working for you at some point recently. So she, she developed many of these methods. And, and the, the, the thing that she does is she uses representation theory. So the idea is that how do you parameterize these linear functions that are equivalent in these tensor spaces? And basically they do this idea based on group representations, which basically says that if you have an equivariant map, um, then 
that is linear, then you can use some properties uh, from like representation theory that says that if you take take your space and decompose this space in the in the irreducible components, then this tensor space you decompose it in the irreducible components with respect to a group action. Then a, a map is equivalent if and only if it maps a uh, irreducible component of the same type to itself by a multiple of the identity. So the idea is they take this space, uh, this space, this tensor space, they decompose the, the input and the output in the irreducible components. So they have these irreducible representations. And then from these irreducible representations, they just read off what are the possible parametrizations that send one space into the next. And that's a paper by Thomas and Smith uh, collaborators in 2018. And they have a very nice implementation, I think, in TensorFlow. Uh, but, but the hard part of this approach is that in order to do this decomposition of this tensor product into irreducible representations, you need to be able to compute the cleft korban coefficients, which is, 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 is known in some cases, but it's hard to do in general. So, so yeah, so, uh, yeah. So to summarize, the idea is uh, you take a field for one neural network and you replace the layers, the linear layers, by linear equivalent layers on tensors, and then you use irreducible representations to parametrize the linear equivalent layers uh, on these tensor spaces. That's the idea. There's another question of like, how do you choose the, the activation functions? And that depends very, uh, it depends on the group that you're using. So in some cases it's easy, but in some other cases it's hard to, to find nonlinear activation functions that work. Um, so that's, that's a reducible representation approach. Uh, my, my focus is different. It's a different approach to the same problem, which is the invariant theory approach. And I think it's simpler, but it, it works in some, for some simple E groups that people use in classical physics, but in general, it's not known what the invariants are. So it may be harder to do in general. Um, whereas the rules of representation approach works in general. So the idea is the following. So we have this, uh, this particle system over here. And the goal is to start just for simplicity. So we have n particles in Rd, and our goal is to find all the invariant functions that take these n particles in Rd and output a scalar. Uh, so we could look at the OD, which is orthogonal group, or rotations, which are like OD is the rotations and reflections. And then there's the Lorentz group, which is, uh, is a similar group, but it has a different inner product and it comes from uh, special relativity. And the idea is that the function that we want to parameterize satisfies that if I rotate all my inputs, the function doesn't change because it's an invariant function. So in order to do that, we can go back to the classical uh, work in group theory by Weil that shows that the first fundamental theorem for invariant theory says that a function is all the invariant, if and only if you can write it as a function of the pairwise inner products of your inputs. This is kind of intuitive, right? So I have a point cloud. So I take the pairwise inner products of my inputs, and then I write a function on that. So if I rotate the point cloud, the pairwise inner products of the inputs don't change. So the function that I write is going to be invariant with respect to rotations. Uh, or OD. Uh, the, the question that we need to ask is like, is that all? Okay. Does that, is that sufficient to write all the functions that are invariant with respect to rotations? And the answer is yes, and there's many ways to see it, but, uh, but that's basically the idea. So that gives you a very simple way to parameterize just the invariant function. So for instance, if I want to learn the energy of this particle system, then I can write it as a function that I learn on the pairwise inner products of the positions and velocities of my, of my, of my point cloud. And that would be invariant with respect to rotations. Um, so if I want to 
of write uh, not just like the, just a scalar function, but I want to write, for instance, predict the dynamics of this point cloud. What I can do is I can parameterize, uh, learn it as, a, as an equivariant function. So say for instance, for each particle or for the center of mass, what I need to learn is a function that takes these n vectors in RD, so the point cloud, and outputs a vector in RD that is equivalent with respect to rotation. So if I rotate the input, the output rotate. And it's, uh, it's not too hard to see that actually a function is all the equivalent if and only if you can write it as a linear combination of your input vectors uh, times uh, a scalar invariant function. So a function of the inner products as in the previous case. And so this suggests a model for the learning. Basically, the model is you take your input point cloud, you compute the scalars, and then you learn different functions, um, f1 through fn, so like this, this uh, coefficient functions, and then your output is going to be a linear combination. And you can implement this in many ways. You can implement it with attention mechanisms, for instance. Um, um, and this is part of something that is, can be seen in like a more general theory that allows you to translate knowledge from invariance to equivariance. And the idea is basically that uh, the equivariant functions are the functions that satisfy like the, this commutative diagram over here. So say I have uh, a vector in B, and then if I apply the group action, here, and let's see if you see it. Uh, yeah, I apply the group action, then uh, and then I, I apply the function is the same as applying the function and then apply the group action in the output. So you can see it as a commutative diagram. And and then uh, just knowing that you have a, a group action in the in this space V and a, a group action in the space W induces an action on the space of maps from B to W so that the equivalent functions are the fixed points. Um, and so that suggests that the knowledge on the invariant maps uh, is sufficient to transport that into knowledge on equivalent maps. So all that I'm saying, and I'm not gonna go into the details of this, is that this construction that I showed you earlier on how to go from like the invariant, the, the, the understanding of what the invariant functions are to what the equivalent functions are is something that you can do in general for other for other groups as well. And so now I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit about this example, which is like a simple toy example, but I think that it explains how these models can be implemented, um, and maybe other more interesting we can discuss more interesting problems where these can can be used. So. In this example, I have like this double pendulum connected with springs. And so the problem is to predict the dynamics of this double pendulum. And so this, this model, this, this, this problem has like, a, like an O2 equivalent. So say if I do a rotation in the XY plane, then the dynamics of the pendulum rotates in the XY plane. But this model is not O3 equivalent or at least not uh, in a priori, because if I do a rotation that moves the z-axis, then the, the, the model doesn't really, uh, doesn't really behave in the same way because of, the, uh, because of how the gravity uh, affects the dynamics. But if you, if you move the gravity vector with the masses, everything at the same time, then that is, O3 equivalent, but this is kind of like a coordinate transformation. So we can say that if you add the gravity vector as an input to your learning problem, then this is an O3 equivalent passive symmetry that you, that you can implement. And so you can learn the position and momentum of your, of your particles as an O3 equivalent function, assuming that the gravity is an input to your model, and maybe the gravity is fixed, which is typically in life. 
but but still you you need to be able to compute the invariance with the gravity as well and so in this model this is a hamiltonian system so this is the strength time translation symmetry where like the the hamiltonian kinetic energy plus potential energy is conserved so if you're going to learn uh if you're going to use a um a machine learning model to learn this you could say you can implement the rotation symmetry this all three and also you can implement the Hamiltonian symmetry as well, like the, the, and then for that, we have two approaches. So the classical neural ODE approach, which is basically you learn a differential equation. You, you, you say my data satisfies the differential equation that I'm going to learn from data. And so this, this, there is a derivative of my state with respect to time. And this is an equivariant function of my input with respect to this, uh, OD, or in this case, o, O3. And, and then we can learn that, and then you, we can use a ODE integrator to do the predictions, and you, we can learn the parameters of the differential equation using that. So that's one way to do it, and this would just learn an ODE. But we can also use the fact that this a Hamiltonian is conserved, and so in order to do that, what we do is we are going to use a Hamiltonian neural network. So we know that the system is Hamiltonian. So there's a specific, uh, specific differential equation that the data satisfies. So I can just make my model to learn a Hamiltonian H, which is a scalar function of my inputs, and then use a Hamiltonian integrator to do the prediction of the dynamics. And that incorporates all the symmetries that we were discussing. So I think this is the answer to the question that I got uh, by TS just earlier. But I, I can comment more on this if you want. No, that's okay. That, uh, I understood it. Thank you. Yeah. So, so the fact that you use scalars gives you the O3 symmetry and the fact that you use a Hamiltonian integrator gives you the uh, the, the Hamiltonian symmetry. And there's other works, like for instance, there's works by Kaniadakis that uh, implement, for instance, some uh, symplectic symmetry in machine learning models by having specific forms of integrators and specific ways to parameterize the dynamics. Um, and so for and this example, this numerical example just shows you uh, here in this, like, this is a, like the trajectory of the masses in phase space, these, these drawings. And this table tells you that the more symmetries you implement, the better the performance you obtain. So here we are obtaining, like, we are implementing uh, the O3 symmetries with the neural ODE and the O3 symmetries with the Hamiltonian ODE. And from here to here, you are, uh, you're, adding one more symmetry, which is the time translation symmetry, and then it works better. And if you go to the right, this, the, the groups that, that you are using are, or the symmetries that you're imposing are weaker and weaker, and this model doesn't impose any symmetries. So for a fixed training set size, uh, the more symmetries you implement, the more constrained the learning is, and you can show there's math results that tell you that the generalization error is going to be small just because you're constrained to a class of functions that is smaller and is uh, consistent with the ground truth solution. Uh, so that is for uh, the symmetries with respect to uh, rotations and all. But other symmetries uh, that have to do with um, units are also useful and interesting. And for instance, in this case, and just in this example, what you can do is you can see that you're predicting this Hamiltonian, which is an energy and has units, kilograms, meters squares divided by seconds squared. So if I do a transformation, my training set, so that everything that had units of kilograms now has units of pounds or everything that had units of kilograms now uh, is multiplied by five, then this, uh, you know, you, you can predict how you, that would affect the output by just doing dimensional analysis. So that's the scaling symmetry. You can think of it as the group of scalings acting on the input um, give you a 
precise known scaling in the output, assuming that all the relevant inputs are uh, in the model. And, and if you do that, then that is another symmetry that you can implement into your model. And one way to do it is by using the Buckingham Pi theorem that tells you that um, that any function that is units equivalent can be written as a function of dimensionless features. So the idea is you take your input and then you can uh, do some transformations of your inputs so that you can construct dimensionless features. So for instance, I can take M, like the M1 divided by M2, that's dimensionless, and then you can construct the basis of dimensionless features. And then you can learn a function of your dimensionless features and, and that's and give you a dimensionless label. And then you can use a fixed scaling to give you the actual dimensional output. And that's something that people do in, in practice in many, in, in many applications, just working on like the dimensionless formulation of the problem. So for instance, in PDEs, uh, people do that all, all the time, just like write it, write it in, in a dimensionless way so that the scaling is correct. So, yeah. So that's the idea. And you can see, I mean, I'm not gonna go into the, into the details of the map, but you can see that this symmetry can be seen as, as a group, like this consistence of the units can be seen as a symmetry with respect to a group action. And the group is the group of scalings. Uh, that have to do with the number of units that, that you have in the model in the models. So here would be like, if you ever like things can have units of kilograms, meters, seconds. So the action is by uh, R. Oops, That's small. It would be an action by like R greater than zero to the three. Like you can scale the masses. You can scale the distances and you can scale the time and that's and then if you scale that then it it affects the output by scaling the masses linearly scaling the distances uh quadratically and scaling the times with like negative one half ne negative two anyway so um finally um i'm going to discuss how can we mathematically explain how much do you gain by imposing symmetries? And so the idea is the following. So if we have um, if we have a learning problem and uh, and you have like a task, a regression task, then you can define the risk of like the expected value of the of the error with respect to a ground truth. And, and so uh, the generalization gap is going to be the risk of your function. And so the generalization gap between like a function f and the projection of f onto the space of invariant functions is going to be the risk of f minus the risk of the projection of f. And you can see that under some assumptions, let's say the group is compact and the and the measure that supports the data is symmetric, then you can actually quantify that the risk, the difference in the risk is always non non negative and it's like just the norm of the projection of f onto the space of invariant functions. So that shows that you always gain something by imposing symmetries in some way. Uh, because like the error that you that you have is decreases by uh, by something that uh, is uh, how much you throw out when you project onto the space of invariant functions. Of course, this has a very uh, strict hypothesis or like uh, assumptions, and it requires that that you can like understand like imposing the symmetries is kind of like doing a regression and then projecting onto the space of invariant functions whereas in practice people don't do that people 
just like do a regression onto a space of invariant functions, so it doesn't really match a projection. But that this is just one way of of explaining it. Um, so we have some uh, applications to cosmology. Basically, the idea is that uh, um, well. David Hogg is my collaborator. He is um, an astrophysicist, and Kate is his student, and they work on cosmology. And basically, what they have is like a, a very expensive uh, hydrodynamic simulation, and then they have a cheaper dark matter only simulation. And so they want to use the cheaper simulation to make predictions of what happens in the in the more expensive simulations. And and so what they do is they write a machine learning model to predict the properties of the galaxies in the more expensive simulations by defining the machine learning model to be uh, respecting this, this symmetry. So they respecting units equivalence and respecting rotational equivalences as well. And they do that by representing the, the data in a way that has to do with the scalars that we just described before. And they and they show that the machine learning models that impose these symmetries work better than the ones that do not impose these symmetries. That's the idea. And they they write it in a way so that the models that they obtain are interpretable. So uh, another application of this uh, is the, to vegetation dynamics. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of this application until unless you ask me, but basically the idea is that if you have a, a simulation of the vegetation dynamics, the things that go into these simulations have a lot of units because they include like the rainfall and the water uptake and the vegetation loss, etc. All of them have units. And so if you if you do it if you do a regression that is units equivalent, then you can see that it will perform better. And uh, um, let me just like show you a little drawing of like how you can extend these two images. And the idea is that when you work on images, you have to use these ideas of scalars or uh, vectors and tensors in, in an image setting. So you can use like you can extend the things that I that I told you about uh, using the scalar formulation for implementing the equivariant functions to an image setting where like when you can do convolutions and you combine this convolution idea with this scalars idea and you can define models that satisfy the similar properties and produce nice pictures. So as a summary, and I am like maybe five minutes over say that uh, enforcing exact symmetries in machine learning give you the correct model uh, good model assumptions, better sample complexity, small generalization error, and we can show uh, how to uh, parameterize certain classes of functions that satisfy the symmetries of classical physics uh, using basically uh, Einstein summation notation. And and uh, we can extend these two images, and that's it. Thank you for your, yeah, your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for a um, wonderful and informal, <clears throat> informative um, presentation. Very nice, very nice. Um, we're going to have a uh, question and an answer session. So we have a 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe I can start with a one philosophical question. Uh, so you start with a neural net model, which is over parameterized. So you have a lot more parameters to tweak to represent something, right? Mm -hmm. So in some sense, you have a over-determined system mm -hmm. uh, with a, um, and you'd like to close that system uh, by introducing some sort of symmetry constraints. Mm -hmm. um, into your equations, right? Um, so that you can uh, generalize better. Um, what if, well, that works when, you know, some system you're dealing with has already, you know, some sort of symmetry has to be there and you can impose that, right? 
But what if you don't know the system you're dealing with? You, you, don't, you don't know ahead of time what kind of symmetry you have to impose. Um, is there a way you can discover that symmetry? Um, yes, that's a, that's a great question. There, there's a few papers, recent papers, that try to learn the symmetry from data. Uh, and they, they do it at uh, different levels of uh, success. But I think that it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question and uh, it's, it's not fully solved. Like okay, people so try to parameterize the symmetries in one or a, another way and then learn that from data and then use that for, for predictions. Awesome. Okay. So there so are works out there. Of course, want, I can, I can point out some references. There's a ref, like, there's some work by the group of, um, Andrew Wilson at NYU, where they do some learning of the symmetries on the fly with, so basically they, they parameterize the symmetries, like using the, like simple things, like say, well, my, my symmetry needs to be implemented as a matrix. It should be local. And then they do, like, they basically ex parameterize this in terms of the exponential map, and then they optimize jointly for the most amount of symmetries and the smallest loss for the training error. And then they just try to do that that way. That's, that's one example. There's right. also a uh, word by Rose Yu in San Diego, where they do something similar as well. Rose Yu, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know her. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so let's uh, move to the audiences. Um, I see Pat um, posted some questions in the chat room. Pat, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question directly? Sure. We can Thank hear you. you. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for your talk. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, you focused on, on neural networks. Of course, the notion of inductive bias is much more broader than that. And I'm, and it's clear that symmetries can play a role to me and, and with many other different representations of, of learned knowledge. So, um, I just want like to understand how much of your analysis is limited to neural nets and how much of it is more general. Um, so the, this is more general in the sense that you don't need to use neural nets. You can use any form of regression and impose the symmetries in, in that regression. So for instance, the people that are doing the work in cosmology are not using neural networks. They're just using simple models and they're using their features so that they satisfy the the symmetries of the problem. Yeah, so. That's good. Great. Thank you. S simple model as such as what? Uh, they are do doing uh, some form of like a lasso, like a linear regression with mm -hmm. with uh, sparse constraints. Yeah. Sparsity constraints. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Pat, that's it? I had another question about scale invariants, uh, which okay, yeah, go ahead. Feels, feels very different from me, but it, but they talk about it as invariants. And so I'm curious as to whether there's any, whether, whether that comes up here. Like scaling invariants. Uh, well, I mean, there's a, there's a branch, there are branches of science that are, who are very, very focused on systems that exhibit the same phenomena at any scale and and, and, and I want to understand whether that's a different use of the term invariance or whether it is similar and there's a way to, to model it in the framework you've proposed. So, for instance, would self-similarity be yes. one of these properties? Yes. yes. So, self-similarity could be phrased in, in, this, in this language, actually. There's a book by Peter Olver where they look at the uh, a cell similarity in, in differential equations and, uh, how we can, uh, look at it in the terms of, of groups invariances as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, and, and, uh, young Sue, I just wanted to mention that Rose, Yu is giving a talk. Right? Like, like in 3 minutes at ISI <laughs> uh, and, uh, oh, share and the link here. <laughs> yeah, uh, you have to register and probably. Uh, oh, really? I'll, I'll, I'll send. I, I, I will send a link, but you have okay. to register. 
um, or you might invite her to this to to the seminar. Thank you. All right. If you, I'll, I'll try and get the link and put it in the chat box. Yeah, that would be awesome. Okay, thank you, Pat. Awesome. <clears throat> any other question? I I don't see any other questions in chat, but um, you can ask um, by unmute yourself and then, yeah. I guess I can ask a question really quick. Um, so part of the coming up with the invariances is sort of doing this projection to a set of parameters, which um, are like, in a sense, the minimum set that you need to describe the system that takes into account all of the symmetries and invariances, right? So like in the double pendulum example, you have the SO2 invariance. Is there any sort of intuition behind what sort of projection you choose to use as opposed to something like an SVD or um, so when we do this, once that we know what is the what is the symmetry, uh, then what we can do is we can write the space of invariant functions uh, with respect to that symmetry. So, for instance, what are the SO two invariant functions? Mm. And and so uh, sometimes there's like very like you can write as the invariant functions are functions of these like small features that you can construct simply from the data. So in the case of say O3, then uh, if you write any function in terms of the scalars of the inner products of your inputs, then that function is going to be invariant and vice versa. So that gives you like I, I think that's where your question was going, right? Like yeah. So what what if it's a more invariant. complicated set of like like a conservation law, something like conservation of energy? Yeah. So if it's a conservation of energy, uh, your you probably have. You you probably have a Hamiltonian, right? That you that you're conserved, that you have conserved. Yeah. And so what you can do is you can write, and and also you know that it will satisfy a specific differential equation. So you can you can use the form of the differential equation that it will satisfy, and then learn the parameters that define that differential equation, and then you you just integrate that differential equation. Okay. So it's basically you have a, a parameterization of the functions that satisfy that property, either via the fact that they are, um, it, like the, the, the scalars are, are constant or via the fact that there's a specific differential equation that the data should satisfy. Maybe you don't know what the parameters are, but if you know that if you satisfy that specific differential equation, then you know that the energy is going to be conserved. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, just really quickly. Um, so a lot of us are interested in embedding um, neural networks inside existing scientific simulations, mm -hmm. in which case we're interested in the networks, not only like representing the physical quantities need to be conserved, but also numerical properties that won't lead to exponential blow up and stuff like that. Do you have any ideas on what kind of symmetries we could employ to um, represent that? Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a tricky question. So, for instance, in the case of this, the, of the scaling invariance, uh, your, your invariance look like quotients of things and that numerically blows up. So if you want to do like, if you want, if you have that symmetry that has to do with scalings, in fact, you can have like very small scalings, like you can work at different scales and that's something that is numerically unstable. So you, you have to be uh, careful with that. Uh, so you would, I mean, that that is more of a, like how how do you do it in practice so that it doesn't really blow up? You have to be careful. So what we did was we construct the invariant features and we uh, allow the invariant features to be within a range. And if it, if it, it wasn't within a range, then we remove them. So since the invariant features can be chosen so that they are, um, um, then you can have more than the than redundant. You can have a redundant set of invariant features. You can remove some invariant features that are ill conditioned and get only use the ones that are well conditioned and that's sufficient to express the moment. So in incorporating redundancies and over parameterization uh, is uh, is better than doing something that that may not have that property. So you can you can remove that ill 
condition behavior by incorporating redundant features. Does, does that answer your question? Um, I think so. I'm more just, I get nervous anytime that I embed an ODE in something if I can't guarantee that it's on one half of the complex graph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have a comment uh, about it unless it's like something specific that I have done before. You know, I think that it could, many problems like that may arise and I maybe I haven't thought about them. Sounds good. Any other question? It's past two after 11. Um, maybe we, it's a time to wrap up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's, let's thank our speaker today uh, for a wonderful talk and wonderful Q and A session. I'm sure there are more questions, but I'm sure, um, you know, so that is going to be happy to get any questions through email. Right. Yeah. 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 Of course. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So please. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for yeah for inviting me and I hope that that uh, was useful uh, to you. Yeah, yeah. I, and I hope that you know after this event is initiating some more collaboration between Lawrence Livermore and your group uh, at Johns Hopkins. So let's hope for that. Thank you. Thank thank you for that.